You might not have noticed it, and no doubt Anthony Albanese wanted you to miss it, but this week he changed the proposal he wants to put to Australians for constitutional change to establish an Indigenous voice to Parliament. When he officially released the draft wording at the Gama Festival in July of 2022, this was what he proposed. One, that there shall be a body to be called the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. Two, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice may make representations to Parliament and the Executive Government on matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And three, that the Parliament shall, subject to this constitution, have power to make laws with respect to the composition, functions, powers and procedures of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. Mr Albanese laboured over how it was simple, just three little sentences, as if to suggest that their brevity made them harmless. But anyone who has had contact with the legal profession knows that even a single word can have a huge impact, whether it's in a contract, a statute, or, even more pressingly, the Constitution. But now he's decided to add some extra words, and they are, in recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders as the first peoples of Australia. Now, those words might seem innocuous enough. After all, no one seriously suggests that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people weren't here first. But if you cast your mind back to the time of Prime Minister John Howard, when he proposed a preamble to the Constitution to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and their culture, the reason that it wasn't supported was the risk that it would lead to judges reading new and unintended powers and changes in the role of governments and the rights of individuals arising from those words being inserted. Mr Albanese now wants to put similar words not into a preamble but into the body of the Constitution where they are actually certain to have the effect. Preambles carry a risk of an effect or interpretation but words in the body of the Constitution? Well, they're a sure thing. Let's bring in Keith Wallahan, the Liberal member for Menzies and a former Victorian barrister to explain how this works. Keith, thank you so much for joining me. These words weren't on the agenda thank even a week ago, even though a voice to Parliament has been Labor policy for years now. What's going on? Thank you for having me, Amanda. And I think this shows that Peter Dutton is right to press for detail because this is far from settled, even the actual wording that's proposed for the Constitution. Uh, there are three pillars to this debate and it's an, one of the most important debates we'll have for our democracy in our time. One is the principle of a voice, of whether it's consistent with our liberal democracy. The second pillar is whether it will actually shift the dial on historical and current Indigenous disadvantage. But the third pillar is constitutional design. And that's not an easy thing for a headline and it requires careful and cold analysis. But you start with this fact that we are one of the oldest, most stable democracies on earth. And a key part of that is our constitution. So whenever we add a word or we make an amendment, there are consequences. And one of the consequences that concerns me most is the voice to the executive. And you and I both know from our previous professions that the area of administrative law invites all sorts of obligations, whether they're explicit or implied. And we need to explore all of those. It strikes me that this change answers absolutely none of the outstanding questions about the effect that the Prime Minister expects a constitutional change to have and it resolves none of the concerns that have been expressed by members of the coalition and many other sensible members of the community. Have those questions been answered? No, they haven't. And, and there's been some serious gaslighting, not, not only of Peter Dutton, but, but of the entire nation. Uh, when those 15 questions were put to the Prime Minister, the initial response was, well, it's all there for you to see in the Karma Langton report. And then when you, and I've read that report, when you look at that report, that's just a report. It is not the official position of government. And there are already inconsistencies in that report between uh, what the government is proposing. So then the government flipped and said, oh, well, this is a matter for the parliament to decide. Well, well let's break that down further. This isn't a hypothetical academic question of a future parliament. 
if this passes later this year, it is this parliament that will affect the enabling legislation. And the Prime Minister commands the numbers in the House of Representatives and has done very well in passing legislation through the Senate. So it's this Prime Minister and this government that will have the detail. So do they have the detail ready? And if so, where is it the Australian people deserve to know? In his address to the Chifley Research Centre conference today, Mr Albanese said that his proposal for change reflects, and have a listen to this. A simple, vital and practical principle that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have a say in the policies and decisions that affect their lives. Not just because, as I've said before, it's got good manners, it's common courtesy to consult people when you're taking a decision that affects them, but also because the practical outcomes will be better. Take the justice reinvestment model in Burke, supported by all sides of politics in the New South Wales Parliament, where instead of sending young offenders to jail, the community takes responsibility for their rehabilitation, co-designed by Aboriginal people, driven and run by the locals. The New South Wales Government, to their credit, backed it. And guess what happened? Juvenile offences went down. Year 12 retention rates went up. Family violence fell. And reoffending reduced as well. The community used their voice to break what was a vicious cycle. The community's voice was heard. And that literally saved lives. Keith, here's surely the rub. This Burke example reflects the fact that, one, consultation is actually happening and it's working, and two, that it's happening without the need to change the constitution. If anything, when I was in parliament, I found Aboriginal groups were frustrated with being over-consulted by the many bodies that exist for that consultation rather than the other way around. So what's the right way forward here? The idea that people should be consulted on laws that affect them, of course, it's, it's a seductive and compelling argument, but, but that's the whole function of the parliament. It's in the name of the House of Representatives. Uh, each seat has about 170,000 people, 112 to 115,000 voters. Our job is to consult and listen to everyone within our communities. Now, the premise of the voice is that that's not occurring or the system is broken. If that is the case, then let's call it out. Who in that house is not listening to Indigenous Australians? Who in the executive is not listening to Indigenous Australians? Because that's our job. And I don't accept that the system is broken. Thank you so much for your time and your common sense, Keith. Thank you for having me, Amanda.